The eighth lap from Lido by the Adriatic to the little mountain town of Carpegna in the Apennines is a lap which inspires awe in most of the riders. Jose Manuel Fuente studies the route. He feels the day holds possibilities because he's on home ground in the mountains. The steeper, the better. They say he'll attack today. But Max has taken his precautions. He sent two of his strongest henchmen, Hoosmans and Schoenmacher, up to the front. And with them as locomotives, he'll control the rate of speed from the foothills. This means forcing the pace, and his opponents are not at all pleased. Here it's Felice Gimondi and Gosta Patterson. Hoosmans keeps up his forceful slogging pace in the lead. And Schoenmacher glues onto his rear wheel, ready to take over when Hoosmans is exhausted. The boss himself is running third, with Roger Switz on his tail, in reserve. Behind this awesome Flemish phalanx, the field is panicking. Everyone's changing gear, desperately trying to get into the right rhythm and to maintain their place in the line. The field is drawn out like an accordion because of the pace of the leaders ahead. Cavalcanti looks over his shoulder. Where's Gimondi? There's a seat reserved for him right here. Cavalcanti is Gimondi's most unselfish assistant. Now it's really important to be up front among the leaders before the field breaks up. And that's bound to happen soon, the way Merckx is heaping coals on the fire now. Zilioli. Gimondi. And Pattison. They're all aware something is going to happen soon. For Fuente, the situation is critical. Up front, it's now Schoenmacher's turn, and Hoosmans drops back. All the strongest have assembled up front. Now the real climbing starts, and the field begins to crack. It's here that the first elimination takes place, and the public are well aware of it. They know this is the spot for breakthroughs and breakdowns. The pace is grueling among the leaders. Riders get coupled off, one after the other. Fuente loses ground, fouled up by a gear change. And now he's chasing the Merx group. Merx himself has taken the lead. But Fuente is closing in on him. Here he overtakes the Olympic champion, Kuiper. And now the Italian veteran, Zilioli. Displaying his brilliant mountaineering style, Fuente continues to close up on Max and company. Francesca Moser is overtaken just as easily. Now he's drawing level with Hoosmans, Max's right-hand man, who has lost ground after his long lead earlier on. Fuente changes gear, passes Hoosmans and keeps up the pace. Now he can see the vanguard. A final surge, and he's up there. The opening round of the fight is over. The decisive eliminations have been made, but stiffer gradients are yet to come. There are four in the lead, and the rest are a long way behind. Between the Babotti Mountain and Monte Carpegna, the final and the most feared gradient of the lap 
there's a 20 mile stretch of nearly level road. The four in the lead are Schoenmacher, Merckx, Fuente, and Batalin. Fuente's rule is never to take a lead. Young Batalin is the man for that. In his first season as a pro, he's about to confirm his promotion. But Max prefers not to let others set the pace. He still insists on forcing the field. It's a question of not giving Fuente a breathing space and getting him exhausted before Monte Carpena. That's Max's tactics. He sets the pace. He leads in his rhythm. He doesn't let others take the initiative. That's his way of dealing with a mounted specialist and such a temperamental attacker as Fuente. Max himself, well, he seems tireless. His own teammate, Schoenmacher, is the first to get into trouble when they start climbing again. But he's done a good job. The decisive phase has begun. The decisive hardship. Now the going is really painful. And there are only three left. Schoenmacher is left behind. Is Fuente waiting, saving his resources for a breakout further on? Hardly, because Merx is unmerciful. He's torturing his fellow travelers with his unceasing back-breaking pull in his typical robust style. He's got into a rhythm which forces the others to give all they've got, a pace which makes hanging onto his rear wheel an endurance test, a torment. Bataline takes a lead. There's the timekeeper driving by with the message that the trio now leads the field by three minutes. Max draws up to Bataline and then increases the pace a knot. Fuente has a hard time keeping up. Fuente has got to yield. That was the death blow. Here we have Fuente, outdistanced. Jose Manuel Fuente, one of the few authentic mountain racers in the classical tradition. him, this lap is developed into a martyr's journey, a path of suffering. A spurt in the mountains, Mex in front of Bataline. The penultimate summit is rounded, and from here there's a very steep climb, the last bit of Monte Carpena, a gradient of 22%, one in four. The two leading riders, it's a fight for endurance. Each turn of the pedals, every single meter gained, hurts. The most beautiful and the most pathetic pictures to be seen in the sport of cycling deal with superhuman efforts in classical terrain. Max is shaking off his last opponent. Max alone out front. And he continues alone, pumping energy down into the pedals. Alone with his body, his ambition, his rhythm.
Max. First over the top of Monte Carpegna. In second place, Bataline, 45 seconds later. And four minutes later, Zilioli. Another minute later, Gimondi, Tesserodona, Motta, Tetossi, and Panizza. Today's loser, Fuente, suffering from painful cramps at the goal line. He got home as number 32, nearly 10 minutes after Mertz. But many other riders besides Fuente had a rough time on Monte Carpegna. Among them, Ole Ritter. It's a bitter day for him, too. He came home as number 29, eight minutes after Max. Which means that he's dropped from his place as number four to number 11 on the total count. This also means that he loses his privileges on Bianchi's team. He can't call his own race anymore, but must stand by awaiting orders from Gimondi, who's running third. Disappointment looks like this. This is how a cyclist looks when he's lost some of his illusions. 